sirens are a trigger for me. Ambulances, fire trucks, police, and there are a lot of sirens in a city. A dramatic increase in opioid deaths. In BC alone, more than 100 people die every month. Deaths from fentanyl spike in Alberta. He died April 30th, 2014. I, I found him in his apartment. That's kind of the day that changed everything. <laughs> we like to play guitar, and he, he wrote lyrics to, to songs. I have his guitar here. Danny was the youngest, and with his siblings being more academically inclined, Danny struggled a bit in school. I think he was almost 16 when he came out as gay. When he came out, it was totally okay for us, like as a family. But I later learned that Danny faced some bullying in school. I think he started to self-medicate with, with substances. Have you ever been there before with the Yellowhead Brewery? Uh, not with the Yellowhead Brewery, but okay. I've been there. With... As a parent whose child is using, especially opioids, um, especially intravenously, you're always afraid that one day he will get bad news. And I knocked on the door. I said his name, Danny. Danny, are you in there? There wasn't a sound coming from that bathroom. And I thought, wow. This, this could be it, this could be the day where I get that news. And I opened the door and he, he was laying on the floor in the, in the bathroom. It's sort of an image that's burnt in, in your mind. It's almost inconceivable that this many people have died without radical change. Since 2014, when my son died, that's when I started looking at the numbers, there have been over 15,000 deaths from drug harms and mostly from overdose. Illicit drug overdoses have claimed the lives of 526 British Columbians. The ripple effect of, of, of 15,000 deaths in our culture, in our small country of Canada, in our small, small population, is it's, it's actually immeasurable. Jordan just came right out and said, I, I'm addicted to Oxy. The doctor yelled at him and said, how did you do this? Why did you become addicted? And then he said, you know, if an addict's lips are moving, he's lying. And we got a phone call in the evening uh, that he had passed away in his apartment by himself, um, having taken these several drugs. It was hydromorphone and it was Xanax and it was an uh, 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 antidepressant. I yelled the word no over about a thousand times that night because I just wanted it to not be that way. So in January 2015, um, this young journalist, Otiana Olivar, she did a beautiful, beautiful spread about Danny. The day the story was published, that was the first time where I felt my heart was a little, like I could, could, could handle that grief. My old dad, old school, sent me a newspaper clipping through the mail, and it was a story of a woman in Edmonton, a family in Edmonton who had similarly lost their son. It was now my friend, Petra Schultz, and she, she and her husband, Rick, had lost Danny, who was the same age as Jordan, 25 years old, when he died. A year later is when we formally put together Mom Stop the Harm. Hello, here from Lethbridge, Mom Stop the Harm. Stop the Harm! Stop the Harm! According to my son. I guess the beginning part of 2016, we had found a name and a website and a, and a mission, and it's been an upward rate ever since then. The numbers that we have joining our group every day are astounding.
we always say it's the good news and the bad news when people join. We're glad when, when people in need of support and in need of information join us, but we also see every day the stories of loss. Every conversation is an opportunity for change. We need to be um, to be outspoken, share our stories. We can't keep it in like a small drug policy one bubble. Not one more. Not one more. When a person tells their story, you see how they have it effect, been affected. You see the emotion. There, there is really power in stories, and stories are transformative. Families can't find resources that are that are humane and who, that are evidence-based. The frustrating thing is that we have the evidence. We know how to solve the problem. We know that people need support. People need housing. People may need medically assisted treatment if they went, want to get off the drugs. We just don't have the will, and stigma is at the bottom. For us in Mom Stop the Harm, the power is that we don't make it to them and us. It's not our kids versus their kids, it's everybody's kids, everybody's loved one. Some parents have almost like a bit of a shrine to their child. We realized that our kids hadn't died because they were bad people or because we were bad parents. They had died because we had bad drug policies and we all felt strong that we had to change that. Many people think they can't survive the death of a child. I get choked up because I didn't think I was going to survive it. Um, so part of what we do every day or tomorrow is to say you will survive and stick with us and we'll, we'll, we'll hold you. We're going to be making a second dish. What are we making then? It's a potato salad. My family is actually German. It's okay. my mother's potato salad recipe. and it's. Uh... We told Danny's truth, but we told it too late. And um, don't, don't let the truth be too late for somebody you love.